Moses wrote that, he was talking about a past event and how those things were still presently around then. But now for us, that's all in the past, a long time ago uh, in the past. So we have to think about time as we read all of this because that's how this is expressed to us. Because that's how God interacts with us. This is how it works for us. Beginning and end, past, present, future, we've got that because we live that. We do it all the time. This is how it works for God to the best of my ability to, to explain it. You have our timeline there, the us, the beginning and end, the past, present, future. This is the life that we live. Uh, but then outside of that, uh, you have the, the, the big ball of stuff. That's really how God sees all of this. He's outside of all of that. He's outside of time, which is what eternity is. Hey, we talk about eternity being a long time. You know what we're trying to say when we say that, but we're wrong. That's, it isn't a long time. There's no time with eternity. It just is. is just, it just is. The state of being that will never stop. Didn't start anywhere. Won't end ever. Just is. And that's where God exists. That's the space that he exists in as far as time is concerned. But God interacts with us in the time that we live in, uh, the, the way that we live things out. I promise we're going to get the Bible, in fact, right now. Uh, if you'll look at Genesis 1, uh, we'll start at verse 5, and then we'll jump down to uh, verse 14. God called the light day... And the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. So you have this uh, God creating, you get morning and evening. That's a, a changing of time in the day, number one. Uh, but then you also have this evening and morning, right, the first day. And as you go through chapter one, you get markers of time. Second day, you know, day three, day four. That's the song that we sing, that we, we teach uh, our kids about creation but there are time markers. Those things that didn't exist before creation, God brings time in. We, we don't have in our song, you know, day zero, day zero, God made time by which we keep, you know, I don't know how we would even rhyme that. But time is a created thing because God's outside of all of that. He's outside of those things, but he makes it for us. Okay, jumping down to verse 14 of Genesis 1. Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. That's all time measurement, and it's a part of the creation. God makes time. He creates time, uh, and that's how he interacts with us. Uh, he interacts with us in our perspective, but he lives outside of it. Hey, that's where all this stuff gets really hard. And at some point... We're going to get to the end of our thing here, and time's going to be done away with too, and we'll be where God is in a number of ways, one of those being eternity, where things just are. And now we are with God, and we could say forever. That's not really the correct way to say all of that. That's time. That's eternity. And we're trying to now talk about Jesus in all of that. that that's why we have to talk about eternity. I, I'm not looking around and seeing a lot of people that are like, this is exactly what I came for. This is the kind of hard-hitting Bible stuff I was hoping for uh, this evening. Okay, so we're going to go right into it, but I want you to try to keep this image in mind, because where it says God, Jesus is in there too. we will say spirit as well. God, God as all three, Father, Son, Spirit, they're, they're there in eternity, acting outside of time, but working within time for our sake. And so as we talk about Jesus tonight, we're going to see, okay, has he existed from the beginning? What was he doing if he did exist from the beginning? Uh, how does all of this stuff work? Let's talk about it. Okay, presence of Jesus here. Uh, we're going to start here in Genesis. We'll read verse 26 here in just a moment. Uh, both Je uh, John's gospel and Genesis begin this way, in the beginning. And now that's not... John being accidental. It's not a coincidence. John is intentionally trying to get us to go, oh, I remember that phrase. He is trying to make a connection to something that we understand, trying to get us to go backwards to the very beginning, to the creation. 
Uh, and so that's why we're spending time in both of these books uh, this evening. It's deliberate for him to do that. Uh, in John's gospel, it's a callback to Genesis. In Genesis, these words in the beginning are the actual beginning as far as we time people are concerned. Okay, we, we care about when do things start? How did all of this get here? Uh, somebody made a comment about if I speak for an hour and a half, which is not my intention, but if I do that, you'll really care about time, I promise. Uh, you're going to start looking and going, I'm not. We care about time. There was a time when this will start. I'll get a bell, I've been told, when there's a five-minute warning. Okay? I have to pay attention to time. We, we all do. We've got to go to sleep so that we can get up and get to work on time, or we have appointments that we have to make. Uh, and so we care about this here in Genesis of how did we all get here? How did all this stuff come together? Uh, and Genesis' goal here at the very beginning, uh, just from a Genesis standpoint, and then we'll throw John in there, just from a Genesis standpoint is to show us here's how things came to be. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's Genesis 1, 1. Okay? And the rest of the chapter plays out the way that you think that it would. Uh, somebody showed me this, I want to say, three or four years ago, uh, that if you, if you take day one, two, and three, uh, they, uh, days four, five, and six are mirrors of those things. Okay, we read day one and day four just a moment ago. You have the lights for evening and day on day one, but then on day four, you have those lights that are now given name and greater purpose and all of this. God sets the foundation on the first three days and then adds to that foundation on days four, five, and six and then finishes everything up uh, on that sixth day and rests on the seventh. It's this great layout. There's that symmetry to it. It's very poetic as far as uh, a writing of creation goes. And it shows us how we began, uh, why we are here, what our purpose is, uh, and the great care that God took with all of this. But as we go and read through this, we get, you know, we get the lights, we get water, we get land, we get plants, and all of these things. And then you get verse 26 of Genesis chapter 1, which if you're just reading through from verse 1, you go, okay, this is a little bit of a change of pace. Now, this is interesting. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the uh, heavens and over the livestock and over all of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God ma created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Uh, and then God blesses them in, in verse 28 and on from there. So you have this, uh, we, we make things on this day. God saw it, saw that it was good, which means functioning as intended is a better way to think of that word. Everything is going according to the plan. Uh, on day one, day two, day three, day four, when we get to day six, it's not just, you know, God made animals and man that day. That's, that's the song. We kind of go, cool, there's cows and camels and people and, you know, whatever other animal, and we're all just the same. There's this break. Uh, well, hold on, we need to back up and we need to pause right here there's something special about this part of the creation. The special thing about this part of the creation, about you and me, that we're made in the image of God. But this phrase catches us off guard. Because in verse 1, it's in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In verse 26, we get this conversation of, then God said, let us make man in our own image. Okay, just from a reading standpoint, you, you do this on an English paper and turn this in. Your teacher goes, who's, who's the hour? Where, where did these other people come from? You never introduce those characters into the story. You just, you've had one singular person, and now you're saying, he, had, he said, let us? Who's, who's that? Who are the other people here in all of this? And it's our first indication, at least in English, uh, where we get this idea of, hold on, there are other people things here than God the Father, which is what we think of. God the Father is creating and going through day one through six, but then we get to verse 26 and it's, let us make man in our own image. There's a plural here. And that's the English. 
if we were Jewish people who understood Hebrew, uh, then the dead giveaway to all of this is in the first verse. Uh, the first verse, I'll, I'll read this to you, but it's going to sound weird, which is why it's not translated this way, because it sounds weird. So, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Hebrew is, in the beginning, God's, he created the heavens and the earth. So when we're thinking about that grammatically, we're going, he, he created the gods and these other things? Is that what that, that's not what it's saying. It is a plural group of people. There's also a sing, they did a singular thing. These, however many there are, did this one thing. We come to know it as we continue to study later. These three did this one. These three acted as one. And that's how this whole thing starts off. It's not just the Father speaking into existence these things. It is they, but also he. Three in one. I don't know if that's harder or easier than eternity to understand, uh, but we're dealing with both tonight, so uh, there we go. Uh, But you have this three in one trinity, as it's called, plural but singular, in the very first verse, Uh, And then we get our clue in English when we get to verse 26. And that's important because it has to do with with us. Let us make man in our own image. So you get male and female created in the image of God. That's what John cares about. Okay, if you'll mark here in Genesis, we'll come back to it in just a moment and flip over to John chapter 1. I normally like to stay in one book, uh, even one chapter if I can, so that we're not flipping a ton. It was necessary uh, when talking about eternity to at least go to to two books uh, here. I said that John begins the same way that Genesis does. John 1, 1 says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Okay, so if, if the initial phrase doesn't get you in the beginning to go, oh, that sure sounds an awful lot like Genesis, maybe I should go back there. If that doesn't do it, it's the following verses that say, let's talk about Jesus, or the word at this point, and the creation. Okay, by him, uh, what are, all things are made, and without him, not anything made uh, that was made. John is trying to point us backwards to the creation, to the beginning, uh, where Jesus, he is going to tell us, has been involved. That Jesus is one of those, let us make man in our own image. That it's God the Father, and at least at this point, the Word who we come to know later as we read through John in verse 14 of chapter 1, uh, is, is Jesus. That being God's image bearer includes bearing the image of the Father, uh, bearing the image of the Son, Jesus, and not really part of our discussion tonight, but that would include uh, the Spirit as well. Uh, So Jesus is responsible alongside the other two for making us in his image. He's there at the beginning with the creation. That's the important part of all of this. In the beginning, God and the Son, they're creating this world that we live in, and they pause to say, These people that we have made need to be made in our image. And I have to think that John is still playing with that idea as we move throughout chapter 1. I want to skip down to uh, verses 10 through 13 of chapter 1. Here's what it says. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. There's creation again. Yet the world did not know him. Uh, He came to his own. And his own people, or his own things, the the stuff that he made, did not receive him. Verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Okay, so what is John telling us right here? He's he's giving us all of the, uh, the buzzwords about Jesus that he's going to use throughout the rest of his gospel here light and truth, uh, 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 grace as well, life, uh, belief. He's going to use all of these words as he moves on throughout. And he wants us to understand this. 
everything that exists exists for Jesus. Everything that exists was made through him, and there's nothing that was made that wasn't made through him. And then he came to those things that he made, and those things, most of them, did not receive him. They rejected the creator. When he comes down, they reject him. But there are those that do believe, that do receive him. And to those people, he gave the right to become children of God, an important phrase that we'll play with the rest of this lesson. Children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. People born of God, children of God. And I have to think that John, as he's writing that, is thinking image of God. People that are his, that belong to him, made in his image, born of him. Right? When you think about uh, kids or grandkids, they mirror in a lot of ways their parents. Okay? They're just like they are. Uh, they learn from them. They have mannerisms like them. Uh, if you spend any time, if my dad and I are hanging out afterwards talking and you spend any time paying attention to that, you will, I mean, we even had this at the beginning. Uh, my dad was arguing with me about something, I think, or you were making fun of me or something like that. Uh, and then he said to, to Gant, this is my son, you know, I'm his dad. Yeah, I could have gathered. That was the response uh, because of the way that we were talking to each other. Because children are like their parents. You, you adopt mannerisms and all sorts of things from your parents. Same idea here. You look like them. You're in their image. And here is John talking about Jesus in the beginning He's there creating, comes to his creation so that that creation can be born of God, children of God, made in God's image again. Okay, so that's, that's his presence. This is Jesus being present in the creation, coming back down to be present in the creation in a physical way so that people could be changed or created, if you want to say recreated, into something new. Children of God, not children of man, not children of flesh, but children of God. That's his presence here on display. Uh, next, we have uh, the promise of Jesus showing his eternality. Okay, back to Genesis, but we're going to go to Genesis 12. I know we're flipping around a lot. It's worth it. All these pieces are going to come together, and hopefully they make sense. If they don't make sense, I wrote out several pages of this that I think you'll get at some point. So just read that. <laughs> It'll be shorter than listening to me too, and probably better. I don't know. It even has the quote from the beginning, so if you want to read that again, uh, you can do that too. Okay, Genesis uh, 12, before we read verses 1 through 3. Uh, my dad and I were actually talking about this on the way over here. You start reading in Genesis. We, we've read, we talked about Genesis 1. You have this great event in the creation. We know what happens next. Okay, Genesis 2, we're going to focus in on this special creation, those made in God's image. Genesis 3, uh, oops, they've messed up. They're no longer functioning the way God intended them to function. The creation's not good here now because they've done something that they weren't supposed to do. Uh, that moves into, wow, the creation's really doing things it's not supposed to do. Cain just killed his brother. This is really bad. Like, things are escalating in a big way. Genesis 5, we get uh, like 1,500 years of genealogy and fast forward to the flood, where we're told in Genesis 6, there's eight good people on this thing, and a lot are really bad. Everybody else is really bad, always, in their thoughts, in their actions, continually. That's how Genesis reads. Then we get the flood, it finishes up in 9. 10, we get another genealogy, and then in chapter 11, Tower of Babel. We, we have these incredible events, and just go right through. And we have some attention to people. We care about Noah. Uh, we talk about Adam and Eve for some amount of time there, though we don't get a ton of detail about them, other than they're important because they're made in God's image. Uh, but you have this, do I get to go until 15 after? I should probably move quicker than what I am, huh? Okay. I got a shrug, so that's, you know, I, I get what I get. All right. When you get to Genesis 12, and if you've done daily Bible reading and read through Genesis, you know this. The book slows down dramatically. 
the way the book is written completely changes. And now the book becomes Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Uh, and in between those four main characters, you have, uh, you have uh, this you know, the thing with Dinah. You have this thing with Hagar. You have these little stories that come up that teach you a lesson about the bigger story that's going on. That's why they're there. It's very cool. But the book slows down dramatically. Uh, and it focuses on these individuals instead of these major events. There's a reason for all of that. We don't have time for that. I'm looking forward to eternity when I can preach forever. But when you get to Genesis 12, you get this one individual, Abram. God speaks to Abram. Here's what we have in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your kindred, your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and in and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Okay, you just jump a few chapters ahead to Genesis 15, because this promise comes back around. And in Genesis 15, uh, verses 5 and 6, we get this uh, restatement here. He brought him outside, look toward heaven, number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, we got a very important word coming up, so shall your offspring be. Offspring matters. So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and it was counted to him as righteousness. This passage comes up over and over again in the New Testament with Paul, with James, over and over again. Because it's a big deal. This, this promise is made to an individual at a time where there has been just a string of uh, this horrible evil done on the world. So we're going to focus in on an individual. We're going to make a promise to this individual, this righteous individual. Uh, and that promise is going to be this thing that God uses to bring about change and undoing to all of that evil that has occurred before it and all the evil that will continue to occur after all of this stuff. So enter Jesus in John chapter 8. If you'll turn over there. We have to move even quicker now uh, with our flipping because I'm taking too long on different things. I talked to my dad for two hours, the whole entire car ride over here. John chapter 8, uh, we'll read starting in verse 39 here in just a moment. But in verses 31 through 59 of John 8, there are 31 times that Abraham's name is used in those 29 verses. Just Abraham, 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 because he's very important. And the most important thing about him is that God makes a promise to this individual. And this promise is going to be seen here in Jesus. Okay, I said offspring was the important word. We're going to start here in verse uh, 39. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. A offspring, we're talking about fathers, who, who, who is their parentage here? They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality, we have one father, even God. Okay, so they're arguing, Abraham's our father, no he's not, because you'd be doing his works. Uh, uh, we have one father, our father is God. Well, here we go. Verse 42, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? Is it because you cannot bear to hear my word? You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God, hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them that you are not of God. So there's this discussion of Abraham's our father. No, he's not. Otherwise, you'd be doing this because he was righteous and you're not acting righteously because you're ignoring me. I come bearing the truth. You don't believe me. Abraham would. Well, our, our father is God. No, he's not because if he was, then you would believe in me because I'm from him. He is my father, Jesus says. I'm his offspring, but you're not listening to me and so he's not yours. You are offspring, children of the devil instead, because you lie. You can't stand the truth, and neither could he. 
It's been lying from the beginning. That's who your father is. That's who you are a part of. And so he puts them in their, in their place over who they are actually offspring of. And if we were to continue to read through this in verse 48, and we'll, make, uh, we'll, we'll read a few more verses here in this section. Jesus makes some incredible claims after this. He's already said, you're children of the devil. Then he does this. Uh, we'll start in verse 51. He makes three incredible claims. Number one, those that believe in him will never die. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Okay, well, in verse 47, whoever is of God hears his words, right? So we're talking about the offspring of God, children of God, people born of God, like we talked about in John chapter 1. Uh, those that are born of God listen to him. Those that listen to him will never die, will never see death. Okay, that's an incredible claim, number one. Number two, uh, chapter 8 and verse 56. This is uh, quite incredible. Uh, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it. And was glad. Okay, that's, for us time beings, that's a weird verse. He, he, he wanted to see this day. He rejoiced that he would see it. He saw it. Okay, so how does that work? How does Abraham see the day of Jesus? Are we talking about a post-Abraham's death thing? Are we talking about something that is revealed to Abraham beforehand about Jesus, who is ultimately his offspring that is going to... But you have this statement from Jesus that said, no, I was, I was there. And if this is not enough, his third incredible claim is in verse 58. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Which is an entirely different book, but you could just go look at Moses' conversation with God. But go back to our discussion on what eternity is. It just is. No beginning, no end. Eternal. That's what eternal is. And here you have Jesus saying, I am. Not I, I was, I will be, I am. No beginning, no end. Eternal. You have Jesus in, this, in these statements not just claiming uh, his uh, eternality, but also his, div his divinity, that he is God, in the context of a discussion about Abraham and offspring and who these people belong to. Okay, we're starting to put pieces together. Last one here, real quick. I have my phone up here because it's an analog clock back there. I can read that, just not quickly. So I have to use the, the digital one. Uh, number three, uh, purpose of Jesus here. Uh, flipping back to Genesis real fast, uh, this is a quicker point anyway. Uh, in Genesis 3, you have the fall, and there is a curse as a result of all of this. Uh, some people, th uh, people think differently about this passage. I'll speak to it just a little bit. I will put enmity between you and the woman. This is the curse to the serpent here. Uh, between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Uh, some people want to say uh, that that doesn't have anything to do with Jesus because it's not directly quoted in the New Testament. Um, to that point, or I guess against that point, uh, there are a lot of passages that are not directly quoted uh, within the New Testament that are alluded to or pointed backwards to in all of this. Uh, for me, what does it is the fact that offspring is discussed. Uh, that word's very important throughout Genesis and as we're seeing now. Uh, also throughout John's gospel. So there's this word of your offspring versus this offspring, that there's going to be uh, a battle here, and you will have a blow that is struck, but you will ultimately lose, and that sure seems like that is all pointing to Jesus and what happens there. All right, uh, flipping back to John for this last part, John chapter 11 passage about Lazarus, though it's after all the Lazarus stuff. You have Jesus' purpose here stated in the book of John, and this, this is not separate from everything else. And when you, read, when you read a Bible book, the stuff that we looked at John 1 and John 8 and John 11 all have to do with each other. John is building a case throughout the book, and he tells us at the very end, 
uh, these things are written so that we may believe. He's trying to build this case about who Jesus is. John chapter 11, we get this, uh, starting in verse 49. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it's better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into the one, uh, into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Okay, Caiaphas's thought is, we've got to kill Jesus because these people are rallying around him. He just raised somebody from the dead. That's a real problem for us. Uh, so we have to take care of Lazarus, number one. But we also got to deal with Jesus because if there's too much of an uproar, Rome is going to come and remove our position of power. That's Caiaphas's thought. Uh, not, they're not concerned about God. They're not concerned about those things because God's not their father. They're not listening to the truth. But the statement that he makes, it's better for one to die than the whole nation, absolutely correct. He just doesn't understand the depth of that comment. He's thinking Jesus has to die so that Rome doesn't take us out. In reality, Jesus needs to die so that all people have the opportunity to come and be children of his, to be his offspring. And you have Jesus go to the cross, and there is seemingly a victory for these evil things, for the offspring of the serpent over the woman's offspring, this offspring of Abraham uh, that is promised to him. There's seemingly a victory. And then you have the resurrection. It's not a real victory. Jesus comes out on top. The offspring of God wins. And those people that listen to him and respond and believe in the one who has always been here, those people win with him as well. Uh, the, we'll, we'll talk about in the devotional time why this matters today. Why talk about all the eternity stuff and all these, why, why talk about Jesus and all these things? Because it matters now matters right now. Uh, we'll talk about that in the devotional time here in just a minute. There's a lot of other things that we could have discussed. Uh, when you read about the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, a lot of people think that that's Jesus. Uh, I'm in that camp. We, don't, we definitely don't have time for that. But it's a great study to look at. Uh, Paul talks about the rock that followed them uh, in their wilderness wandering uh, being Jesus. Is that literal, metaphorical, whatever? Here's the point of all of those things. The point of all of those things goes to the purpose we just looked at. That this offspring of God who created the world came to that world, that creation that he made. He was present in all of it so that he could fulfill the promise made to Abraham about himself. The, the promise that God made to Abraham was about Jesus, the offspring that would come and bless all of the nations. He came and was present to fulfill that promise to accomplish the purpose of dying for the sins of all so that we could not just have our sins removed but also, uh, but also be able to live a better life in him as his offspring, children of God, born of God. God was there from the beginning of... Jesus was there from the beginning at the creation. Jesus came to that creation, and he came so that we could be created into this new offspring, this better people of his. Always there, still there, Jesus is. And we'll talk more about why all of that stuff matters here in, in just a moment. I had just enough time to end a little early, but if I said anything more about anything, would go five over so uh, the rest of this time is yours I'll use it for the Devo I guess I don't know uh, but thank you very much we talked about tonight uh, whether you were in here or not uh, this is pretty uh, straightforward to to grasp I think uh, we talked about Jesus and his eternality that he was the creator and then he came to that creation that's his his presence uh, that he came to that creation uh, in order to save uh, the nations from their sin, that's, that's purpose, uh, and that his, uh, his coming was a fulfillment of a promise, that he was the offspring of Abraham, 
uh, that makes us offspring of God, children of God, born of him. Uh, we looked at in the class a how we view time versus how God views time. I, w- I want to look at one more of those, uh, hopefully a little uh, more straightforward. John, in his gospel, uses both of these phrases. Uh, I, I believe the last day shows up six times, uh, but really five in, in what we're talking about here. Uh, but you have John start with, in the beginning, and make references to the beginning throughout his writing. Uh, but he also makes references to the last days, these days that we are still living in. It's been a lot of last days, but there are a lot of, there are a lot more days before the last days, so we might still have a ways to go, who knows. Uh, But John talks about in this gospel uh, the beginning uh, of Jesus coming and being the creator and coming here to create us into something else, uh, and now the last days. Uh, And Uh, From our perspective, from John's perspective, as guided by God working in time, this is how things look. We we had our starting point. There was a starting point of we got to bring Jesus into the world. Uh, He's there from the beginning, uh, but he comes into a beginning point where he's physically here on earth to change things for us. Uh, And then Jesus talks to us about the last days, Uh, these days where... Uh, God will still be dealing with evil, but finishing uh, the dealing with all of that. Uh, Where God is still going to be, uh, through the message of Jesus, bringing people into this new creation of being children of God. If if you exist, you're made in God's image, but there is a level up to that, of of being a child of God, uh, born uh, in Jesus Christ. God began, and one day we're going to reach the very end conclusion in the meantime. Jesus being present from the beginning needs to continue to remain present until that end. And that takes place with Christians. It takes place with uh, those people that are his children. So first here, I want to talk to those that uh, are, are not Christians yet. This purpose and promise and presence of Jesus from the beginning, uh, coming to earth that way, his continual presence now at the right hand of God, and when he will eventually return uh, to this earth to bring his children home to him. That's been God's plan from before the beginning. Uh, and he's had you in mind from before the beginning to, to, in Jesus, make all of these things happen so that you could be his child. Uh, And and I hope you will think very seriously about that, uh, making that decision, uh, and and what that decision means. Here's what that decision means. Okay, now I'm talking to those of us that have made that decision, uh, that have listened to Jesus, received him, believed him, been born of him, as John talks about. If you're a Christian, you are a participant in his eternal plan. We didn't mention this in the class. I could have. I probably could have fit this in in those last two minutes. You have with Adam and Eve, when they are made, they're given some commands. There's one that's negative. Don't eat from this tree. But the others are positives. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. They're actually told to leave the garden before they actually get kicked out of the garden. The purpose of God was go. Go. And he tells them to do that in Genesis chapter 1. Then as you fast forward a little bit and you get to Noah and you have the flood and everything that comes after that, Noah, when he and his family get off the ark, he's told, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. The same command, go, go and take this out. Uh, And instead of having a world that is full of corruption like we just had, let's go and have a world filled with righteousness, uh, influenced by people that are children of God. Uh, You can fast forward just a little bit more to Abraham, and he is noted for being righteous because God said, go, and Abraham said, I will go and be your child and go throughout this world, bringing your influence to other people. And you can keep going and going and going through the book, and what you're going to find is the same theme, and that's no different today. If you are a Christian, you are a part of God's eternal plan to carry out his purpose to save all nations by declaring Jesus as the fulfillment of the promise of God 
by bringing the lost into his presence to become children of God. When you became a Christian, you accepted that role. When you became a child of God, you accepted the responsibility to go and bring others to him so that they could be created to be children of God as well. So tonight, uh, if you're not a Christian yet, we can study with you. You're interested in in wanting to know more. Uh, There are plenty of people here that would love to sit down with you and study with you uh, and show you what it takes, how you become born of God, and how you become a part of this eternal plan. If you are a Christian, maybe you haven't thought about uh, the plan that God has asked you to be a part of. So your, your priorities are you're out of whack because you, you haven't thought about that. Hey, we want to help encourage you to get back on the right track. Uh, maybe you know that that is your responsibility, but it's been difficult for you to do those things. Hey, well, we want to help come alongside you. That's what the family of God does. And strengthen you so that you can get going in the direction that God wants you to move in. Maybe you are dealing with something right now that is so, so crippling, so, so drowning, so difficult that you can't really think about doing anything else. And we want to help with those things too. Because God, from the beginning, Jesus, from the beginning, his eternal mission was to come to his creation, fulfill the promise made to Abraham, and save all of the nations in him, bringing them into his family, making them children of God. And that purpose from eternity is our purpose in these last days. If we can help you in any of those ways tonight, let us know. Come as we stand and sing.